All right, welcome back to Doc's House Calls. Today we are joined by Jose Miranda from Isotope Watches. Jose is based out of, I believe, London, the United Kingdom. Is that right, Jose? That's correct, yes. Okay, but you're not British by birth. I guess you're from Portugal, is that right? Yeah, so I was born in Portugal, uh, but I've been living in the UK for the last seven and a half years. Okay. So even, not even, when Brexit happens, I'm, I'm, I have the right to, to remain here. That's fine. <laughs> so you and I have been friendly for a while, but this is the first time we are speaking live. We've just traded emails and messages, you know, through Facebook and what have you. Um, and, you know, you and I used to talk more and, and we don't talk as much recently. So I kind of lost track of what you've been up to. So I thought it would be a good idea to get you on the show and uh, find out what you've been up to recently. Uh, and what you're working on for the future. So um, why don't we start with this? A lot of people like to know, you know, sort of from the beginning, how the brand started. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do with your day job, if you're not doing this full time, or what you used to do if you are doing this full time, and, and how did that transition you into making watches, or what got you into making watches? And I'll just, you, you go, you just start. Yeah, okay, so, uh, well, first of all, Thank you for inviting me. This is uh, an amazing opportunity to, um, to speak with you, obviously, and also to, to show a little bit more of who I am and uh, why I'm uh, doing all these sacrifices to have a brand. Um, uh, yeah, but I, th I think that's, everything started when I got my first real paycheck when I was 20 something. And uh, I bought the Breitling. Uh, the, the Breitling, it was the Breitling Jupiter. Uh, and a few years later, I, I came to discover that the Breitling uh, was a quartz watch. I had no clue. And uh, it was um, um, uh, a Japanese quartz. So it not even was a Swiss quartz. So was it a fake? <laughs> was it, or was Breitling just making watches using Japanese movements? Was it a fake? All the Jupiters have, have, have a, a, a Swiss, a Swiss um, a Japanese quartz. Okay. okay, so it was a Breitling, but it wasn't Swiss made. It was just a Japanese quartz movement. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, it's an interesting story. Uh, so the years go by, I started to understand a little bit more of uh, watches. I started collecting them. Uh, during all my life, I have been uh, fortunate to have uh, uh, to have some money to spend with, with watches. I did, um, I've been a producer for uh, almost 30 years now, uh, working in advertising, communication, film production. And lately I'm working on a startup called Touch Surgery. And we have an app uh, that uh, uh, helps surgeons to get trained uh, to commit less mistakes during surgery. Uh, and not only improving their performance, but also saving money to the hospitals. Um, yeah, so it's an, uh, the app is on, is on the, the, the Apple Store or Google Store. Anyone can download it. Anyone can. You want to tell us the name of the app? It's Touch Surgery. It's the touch, surgery. touch Surgery. Yes. Okay. It's quite interesting. It can get some, you know, some people might get impressed with what the things we do there. <laughs> But that's, that's quite inter interesting because you can follow uh, a surgery step by step and learn. Uh, so it's hopefully the doctors aren't using the app while they're actually performing surgery. Uh, so they can train and then uh, they can execute it uh, better than, than, uh, than before, obviously. That's, that's, that's what we aim for. Uh, but uh, there is, we have other products. One of them will be for surgeons to um, to assist surgeons during the procedure, but that's that's another thing. So that's another. And you uh, don't have a background in medicine. You're a video producer mostly. Exactly. So okay. it's 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 difficult to learn the language, uh, but um, you know production at the end of the day is it's whatever we are producing. Your involvement in the app is on the video production side within the app. You've animation. doctors and other people involved in the technical side of exactly. medicine of, of what's going on. Got it. 
Yeah, so we have video and uh, CG animation, so we are in both both areas. Okay, so that's what I've been doing for the last uh, year and a half, more or less. But uh, uh, in 2016, uh, maybe in 2014, I wanted to buy a jumping hour, and I was looking for uh, another jumping hour from Gerald Genta, uh, but I didn't found. I wasn't found, so okay, so the ones I wanted were too expensive uh, and I wasn't really finding nothing interesting for the, the, the price range I wanted. So, so jumping hour, for those who don't know, is instead of the watch having an hour hand, there's a window that displays a number, that's the hour, and every hour it's literally supposed to jump completely to the next number. Exactly, that's the one. Put up to the camera so they can see what, what that looks like. Yeah, that, see that, that window at the bottom is not the date. That's the hour. Exactly. Okay, so what was the price range you were looking in when you were shop, shopping for one that you couldn't find? I was looking for something around two thousand pounds, more or less two and a half thousand. They can be expensive, and and I know there's, I know there are some Chinese-made watches that are called jumping hours. I don't know if they're true jumping hours or if there's just a disc in there that rotates very slowly. But a real true jumping hour. Literally, the hour jumps forward, and that's kind of a complicated thing to accomplish with a watch movement that's normally about the hour hand moving very slowly, so slowly you really can't even tell that it's moving at all. So it's a very difficult complication to find, which is why the prices are higher. Exactly. So it, it demands, uh, so the way I wanted it is the way I built it. So uh, we have a base movement. In this situation, it's the ETA 2824, and on the top of the movement we have a model uh, with a specific construction for this uh, watch uh, and it has a star on top of it and each star uh, it's it's a jump basically so um, this is sort of in, in in watch geek language this is kind of a hybrid of off-the-shelf technology with the movement but then something almost custom built in house that you actually had to go out and hire a team to build you. Absolutely, exactly. So it's sort of, this is starting to get into higher end horology as opposed to what most of us do, which is just, we use a movement that's off the shelf and we build the design around that. Yeah, so that's, that was the idea. So I, I, I wanted the jumping hour, I couldn't find it. My wife told me, why don't you make your own? So I start working on it. <laughs> so yeah, so we start working on it. We start, I start searching. I, I studied a little bit um, about movements and the watch construction, etc. cetera. Um, unfortunately, I don't see too well to, to keep on working with, with movement. So it's quite difficult for me um, uh, uh, because of my sight, but that's fine. Uh, so the next step was to understand uh, how the process could be built. Uh, so back then, you, for example, and, and a couple of other runs were having lots of success on Kickstarter and uh, starting your own campaigns and your own projects. Not starting, you were already in the market. Uh, I think with uh, Lewis and something. Lewis Lou and Huey. Right, well, we, we were on I Kickstarter. I didn't and know. It was back then, I love them. It was the design was fantastic. I really liked it. Yeah. So, what what year? Uh, what when was this when you were starting to work on your watch and your brand? 2015. 2015. Okay. So that was before I started NTH, and I had already had I don't know four or five projects on Kickstarter. So you were watching me, but also a bunch of other guys. By 2014, Kickstarter mm -hmm. just exploded with watch projects. Exactly. I, I once I, I even had one when uh, Lewis and I had one. I don't oh, one of what? what? One of your watches. I have one of the first ones. Which one? It was a Lewis and Hewitt, but I don't know which one. Okay. Was it, a, <laughs> was it the chronograph or? Uh, no, it was it was not the chronograph. Vector, Akiona, doesn't matter. Okay. So it was, it was I loved it. It was that, quite interesting. Anyway. So 2014, started working on the brand. I didn't have a name. I didn't want to really have my name uh, because my last name is Miranda and uh, Miranda 
Um, uh, it's in most countries a family name. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it didn't make too much sense to have. Well, in, in English, it could be a woman's first name, Miranda. That's that's why. So it didn't make real, really good. You know, it did make sense to have my name on the brand uh, because I didn't want to make. Um, make it look that it was a word for women only. So right. I, I opted to try to find another name. And um, I found the name isotope, which I thought it was quite interesting because uh, in science, isotope represents uh, an atom that is uh, that has the same characteristics as the others, but um, a different uh, shape, let's say it. Right. So, so that's what watches are. We are, you know, all the watches are belong to the same class of instruments, but they all have different shapes. Right. Therefore, the isotope, and it was open to register, so I, I could register the name, which was fantastic, and um, I'm I'm really happy with the name until today. Yeah, so, I think it's a good name. It's it, it's not hard to pronounce. It's you know, it's unique. Yeah, yeah it, it, and I think a great name for a brand sort of helps to people to understand what the brand is all about and, you know, helps to sort of inform the story of the brand. And, you know, again, it's also, you know, from a practical perspective, you need to be able to register the name, trademark it, find the URL that isn't already being used. And it has to look right on the dial. Can you incorporate it some way into a logo? I think it's a great name. Yeah, thank you. No, it's, it's working very well. And I think uh, no one has ever criticized the name negatively. So I'm happy with it as well. Okay, so we had the name. Means, meanwhile, I was looking for uh, solutions to create a jumping hour. Um, but I was really having lots of difficulty to, to navigate within uh, the, the, the market. So when you they- were a supplier. You were having trouble finding a supplier. Yeah, suppliers and, and not only suppliers, how to get into the 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 universe of watch production. So it was really complicated. So I started with an alternative brand, which did not succeed. Um, and then uh, when I was okay, so I'm happy with what I know now. So let's try to find someone to really help me uh, build this. So I started looking for a designer. Um, and I found a designer uh, that works uh, with um, Konstantin Shaikin, uh, the Russian um, watchmaker that made the Joker. Yeah. Okay, that's the guy. Um, he had a, a previous model called Nunacold, Lunoko. And uh, I simply love that watch because it has a, a very a, a, a huge complication with the moon, with the rotating moon. So, yeah, so the design, uh, part of the design was created by, by um, Vikenti Grasnov. And uh, Vikenti has a, a studio design in St. Petersburg. And um, so I contacted him, we started exchanging ideas. Uh, I told him exactly what I wanted to create a brand and start to creating some um, uh, uh, concepts. And uh, then he was able to integrate the, the concept of the, the flowing movement with the design we had for, or the concept we had, we had for the, the jumping hour. And- uh, so this became the rider, the jumping hour. Yes, yes, yes. That was the first one. So we began creating um, lots of sketch. You know, it took us about, it took us about one year to get to, to, to the right design. 20. Uh, because you, it took you 20, 20, 20. 20. Sorry? It took you 20 days, tries? To, uh, oh, one, year, one year. 20, two. One year, 12 oh. months. Oh, one year, 12 months. Got yeah. it. Okay. Sorry. It was a long, long time to do it. So, yeah, because we wanted it to have uh, a window, for example, at 6 o'clock because it's something interesting because most jumping hours have the hour at 12 o'clock. Right. And when the, 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 the seconds and go over or the minutes and go over, 
the uh, 12 o'clock, the hour changes, which I right. don't think makes But also, sense. you know, from a, from a legibility standpoint, if the hour changes as the minute is passing over, the minute hand is obstructing your visibility of the hour. Whereas at six and the minute hand is up here, you can actually very clearly see the hour window as the hour is changing. Exactly, that was the idea. So to make as readable as possible, as simple as possible. And so the inspiration was, um, so we get two results. So once we had the results, I uh, had already been discussing with some uh, uh, houses in, in Switzerland uh, uh, how to do it. And um, that's when the problems began because I started working with the company uh, on the French side, there is others in the, on the German side, they don't communicate. Uh, then one of the companies shut down, so I had to move to another one. Uh, once I was m making the model, th that company had suffered some transformation as well. Uh, so the prices went up. So like, I remember cool. when you and I first started speaking, I remember hearing you or lit or what reading you talking about some of the problems you had already had or maybe were still having because you were still in pre-launch but i never really got all these details so you know how how many different vendors did you end up going through between first looking for somebody to make this and finally getting it made oh eight so you went through eight different suppliers to yeah. finally get this watch to market. Exactly. It was the very problems were companies that could do one thing but not another thing, and you know some were French, some were German. They didn't like each other, or they didn't get along, or they didn't agree. And yeah, you're stuck in the middle. And meanwhile, you're spending money. You're wiring funds for them to do whatever. You're, you're cutting checks. Absolutely. <laughs> that no, the, the the learning process. Uh, it was very, very complicated because I started uh, with the most difficult uh, situation I could ever. Yeah, you really imagine. did. I mean, your first watch, you're already into like haute horology. Again, you weren't doing anything off the shelf and you had never been in the business before. This is an incredible thing to try to take on, a challenge to overcome for somebody who's never done anything like this, even remotely related to this. Exactly. And if I knew now, or if I knew then what I know now, I would have started with a very uh, with, with a simpler project, let's say. Right. Uh, because uh, when I was creating this, I thought, Jesus, if this is you know, watchmaking, uh, it's madness. I can't do this anymore. I'm going to to quit. I'm going to change. But you then know, I, you, you say if you started, if you did, if you knew then what you know now you might do things simpler. And I completely understand because, you know, my first watch was a chronograph, we used a Chinese movement. I didn't know then what I know now, which is, you know, those movements had a really high defect rate and I was walking right into this sort of hornet's nest of future problems. And now I, I look back and go, if I knew then what I know now, I would never have done it. I, and, and now I do things a lot that are much more simple to accomplish. I, I kind of, I feel like, maybe it's a good thing that we didn't know because we would never do these things and these watches wouldn't exist if we, if we all knew. But as a, as a guy launching your company, it's a nightmare to go through that with your very first project. It is. It, is a, it, it was a nightmare and it still is a nightmare because I am now, um, uh, I now need to have a new supply. Yeah, so uh, I am now looking for another supplier to make part of the cases uh, because uh, this has been built customly. So uh, when I have 20 orders, I make another 20 uh, that, and that's how I've been delivering it. But uh, the last case producer has now stopped working as well. So I'm moving to another one. <laughs> so you actually have to change suppliers of a model while you're still making the model. It's not like me where I go, all right, I made 300 pieces or 500 pieces of the orthos, and now we're gonna make another round of them, but we're gonna make 300 pieces with a different factory, which I've actually done. You're still making the same model, same movement, same 
other components, but all of a sudden the case supplier isn't working out. You have to find a different case supplier and, and to do things the old supplier used to do. Exactly. So the model is the same, but the case, it's another supplier. Yeah, and I mean, that, it's like finding a part for, it's like finding a part for a car. Exactly. If you don't have the car, you're gonna go and find the car to fit the part, as opposed to buying the car and then finding the part to fit it. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's that, that's it basically because it's um, uh, you know it's the the way I wanted to do it unfortunately is a complicated way. So yeah, you make things as hard as possible. If anyone, listens, <laughs> if anyone listens to this, you know, and I wants to start making watches, start with a simpler one, you know, because this yeah. one uh, it's it's complicated either. Or okay, if you can do it, but in a very, uh, in a in a very expensive way, is to find the same supplier that creates the model and creates the case. That is the ideal, but the price will be really really steep. It's going to be very expensive. So you're using all European manufacturing, which of course drives the cost higher. You're using all Swiss movements. A lot of what you're doing is custom. I mean the the. The rider wasn't just a custom movement. It's a very unique case shape. It looks like a, a UFO almost. It's a loveless case. You had to get a, a bracelet custom made to fit. I mean, it's a custom designed bracelet, unique to your watch that fits that case. Um, and it's, you know, I, I imagine some of the challenges you went through were pretty daunting, especially for somebody who didn't have any experience and was learning as they went. Still are even even with experience and understanding now that you know paying or being asked to pay twelve thousand uh, Swiss francs for a prototype uh, was an absurd. You paid. They asked you for twelve thousand Swiss francs, which is like twelve thousand dollars for a prototype. Exactly. Yeah, and a lot more. Ooh. If, if we start talking about numbers. <laughs> well, that's insane because, I mean, I'm not saying I don't believe you. I'm saying in my world, when I was still making prototypes, I could get like four for $1,000, $2,000. Now, to, to, if, you tell, if somebody told me I had to spend $12,000 to get prototypes, I mean, what, what they're really saying is we want to make sure that you are committed to making this watch with us so we're going to charge you a lot of money to make sure that you're committed. And, and it's like you get married to them because of that investment. You can't walk to another factory. And, and, I, and I thought I was, uh, but they shut off their door, so I wasn't anyway. That's, that's, a, that's a crime. So you made the rider, and then your next model was yeah. the Palancino de Perle? Is that? Yeah, so the Palancino, um, it's here. It's a beautiful um let me show you come here and I, I like that your some of the design themes are carrying over from one one model to the next but it's a very you know much more uh traditional sort of case shape and, and design obviously it's a three-hander yeah but uh, we have we, we still have the um, the concept uh of the balloon shape on right. the diver, uh that uh, we for example on the diver that we are now making, the balloon shape becomes a water drop. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's why the, the other watch is called Good to Do. Uh, because Good to Do, water drop or droplet, uh, it's, on, it's, it's on, the, on, the, on the opposite direction. So right, the these, Palancino, these words, Good to O and, and Palancino, are these Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian? What language are we speaking here? Is, and I, I named the first, the first one, the, the Rider, uh, was named after the film Rider. Uh, okay. Because it's, it's, a, it's a, 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 a driving watch. Okay, this is, that was the concept. So that was motorsport themed, you know, automotive themed, the Rider, yeah. jumping hour. All right, and then you made the Palancino. Yeah, Which, the Palancino is, is a balloon. Italian? Sorry? Is Palancino Italian? Palancino is Italian, exactly. Okay. So Palancino means balloon. Balloon. Okay, so it's a balloon of pearl and what's the de Acciao? I don't know how to say it. So that's the man version. Okay. Palancino, so this is 
um, uh, the Palantino, the pearl, or, or mother, it's made of the center is made of uh, mother of pearl. Mother of pearl. <clears throat> Sorry. And the men's version, the center is made out of uh, stainless steel. And okay, got it. Diaio means steel. Dacio means steel? Exactly. Okay, so it's a, it's a Palantino of pearl and steel. What yeah, does Palantino mean again? Balloon. Oh, it's a balloon of pearl and steel. Got it. Exactly. Because, okay. Just because of the shape of the, of the dial. That's only because of that. Okay. Uh, but Palantino... But that's, that's not ready for delivery yet. You're still in pre-order on that? No. So I stopped um, uh, because I, I tried the Kickstarter on it, uh, but it didn't succeed. So I canceled the production. Okay. Uh, back then, I only had the, the women's version. So I stopped to create a men's version. And very soon, I will try again to make them. But now, with a specific women's version and the men's version. Okay, so you're going to make two different versions, one for women, one for men. Yeah. All yeah, right, with and then... Several colors on the dials, that's, that's the, the process. All right, so you put that one on the back burner, so to speak, you know, sort of up on the shelf, come back to it later. Now we get into the Goat de O, which I think is French. Go. Yeah, Goat de O is French. It's Goat de O. Okay. And that means drop of water. Yeah, water drop. Water drop. This is the one. All right, so this is the diver. It's got an internal bezel, so it's a compressor style case. It's a compressor style, exactly. Cushion case. Yes, uh, but it's very well disguised because we have these shoulders here that make it look a bit different from uh, a cushion case. Right. Um, yeah, so it's not just a typical Panerai sort of case shape. It, it's got its own case lines. Um, Oh yes, it's completely different. It's, yeah. It's, uh, so our our concept is um, what, what what we tried to achieve was uh, using the same dimensions of the, the dimensions of the um, the, the the Rolex Submariner uh, make a complete different design. That mm -hmm. was the, the, the initial concept. So use the same dimensions because that's what the market really wants. Uh, there is no need to, you know, to. So it's a 40, it's a 40 millimeter case, a 40, 40 millimeters across. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, try to do it with the same height, which is very difficult. Oh, yeah. Uh, because for that, we had to uh, start the prototypes with, um, uh, with the Miota 9015 to make it the thinnest possible. We also tried with the ETA 2824. But unfortunately, during the, the the process to get the pre-orders um both movements are extremely complex to, to find in the market and uh, it's 24 from eta yes right so just i want to fill people in that aren't paying attention so yeah eta makes movements they're owned by swatch group swatch group has had this 10-year plan starting in 2010 to start cutting off their supply of movements, but also parts for movements to the market, where they're gonna make sure that they only sell their movements internally to the Swatch Group brands. So that leaves manufacturers like us either unable to get the movements or we have to get them through other third parties. It's created this sort of lack of supply in the market. The prices have started to go up very dramatically. And if a small company like ours is in the middle of developing a new model using that movement, and then all of a sudden, one day you can't get the movements anymore, it creates a lot of challenges. So you were originally looking at the 9015 and then the ETA. Now you're on to the Seiko NH35 as one choice, and then the Salida, which is sort of like a clone of the ETA, as the other choice. Do I have that right? Perfect. That's exactly it. Yeah, but these... Two new mo uh, movements, they are slightly higher than the previous ones. Right. So we are going to uh, need to increase the height on about 1.2 millimeters. Are you, are you increasing the height by raising the crystal or making the case back lower? How, how are, or are you just changing the whole case? No, um, we are changing the case and the case back as well. Right. Uh, so we decided because I could create um, a case back that was uh, 
bit lower, but it will look really ugly on the wrist. So we did the same thing. We had a model called the Tropics, which we originally were thinking we would use the Miyota 9015 because it's very thin. And then for various reasons, I decided we were going to use the STP movement, which is a clone of the Yetta, which is a little bit thicker. And so we had to figure out how we were going to get this thicker movement into the case without completely redesigning the case. So we ended up, we moved the crystal up a little bit. We moved the case back down a little bit. All, all in, the proportions were pretty much the same. It was a very small change. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it could be a challenge, especially after you've already done all the tooling on a case. Yeah. You have to change the internal cuts and the in movement spacer. You got to move the crown sometimes. It's, it's challenging from an engineering standpoint. Yeah. So yeah, but the engineering has already done the changes. So we have approved that. Um, and uh, we were, um, you know, at least I was uh, trying to get um, the goal of our pre-orders on Kickstarter. Um, and then I moved the pre-orders to our website. Did you, did, so you had a Kickstarter project and what, it didn't hit the goal? And I canceled as well because it was not going to reach the goal. Right. And, um, I, I don't know. I, I think that... Uh, I don't get lucky with Kickstarter, you know, because everybody likes the design. Uh, you know how, 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 how awful internet can be for our designs. Uh, you know how internet can be bad for, for, for everything, not only. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you, if you put your design out there on the internet, people, are going, if people are going to feel more Certainly, if you show somebody in person, I think most people will be a little bit more hesitant to be overly critical or hypercritical, whereas on the internet, people aren't face-to-face. -face. Sometimes they're anonymous, or they're, they're, they're much more free with their <laughs> expression of opinions. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's, it can be... But anyway, I yeah. put it out there, not even one bad uh, critic or review about the watch which is a miracle. So even after- a good design. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's amazing. And everyone that I have shown the design in person, uh, they love it, you know, and, and once they, they put it on the wrist, they say, okay, so now I get it. I understand all the fuss on the internet because it's really amazing. And it is, but, you know, in terms of uh, the acceptance of my designs or, or uh, our designs, uh, on Kickstarter, I am not, uh, I don't get lucky. So that's fine. I get, I'm over it. I moved the pre-orders to our website. We got to, 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 to the goal in, in, a, in a couple of, yeah, of days. So you're making the watch now. Yeah. That's so great. So we have, you have success even without Kickstarter. Absolutely. Good. That, that outstanding. was the only way. <laughs> So, but I'm looking at your website right now. We can actually still pre-order this right now if we want. Exactly. Yeah. And it's yeah. a great price. I mean, it starts at 300 and, is that 305? 300, dollars is what I'm looking at. I assume that's what, that's what's on page 35. Is that including the VAT or is that not including the VAT? Uh, I am a very small company, so I'm not VAT registered yet. You don't uh, have to, you don't have to charge the VAT? No, I don't charge the VAT but I will absorb the VAT. So it's basically, I'm making a 20% discount to my clients at the moment, basically. Well, and just to $300, is that including the bracelet? Everything, yeah. That's a, I mean, even for just the Seiko NH35 movement, that, that beautiful design, the, the water resistance, the loom, the spat, I mean, it's an original design, very unique, but yet not, crazy like a gimmick design it's a beautiful watch great design i'm sure it's going to be very well made on a nice bracelet uniquely designed bracelet yeah. for just over 300 dollars. that that's amazing and then if you want the swiss movement just over 400 dollars. again yeah. a fantastic bargain now yeah at the moment and we are going to keep those prices for um, a few more days, then they will need to go up slightly. If somebody wants to watch, they want to go to isotopewatches.com. 
and look for the Goat to O. It's G O U T T E D apostrophe E A U. Goat to O. That's the watch, still available in pre order. And it's gorgeous, but yet not as, not as a, um, it's more traditional than the original rider, which was extremely unique in terms of case design and, and the lines. This is something that is a little bit more recognizable because it does have some more traditional forms. And yet you still have the teardrop shape on the dial. I see that you incorporated that into the markers. Um, you know, yeah. It, it, is that a sandwich dial? It is, isn't it? Is it exactly sandwich yeah. dial? Uh, yeah. And uh, and the 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 um, the bracelet is similar to to the, to the rider. So yeah. we are adopting this uh, design to all our models now. So it's going to be. Yeah, I, I like that you're carrying the, the design themes from one model over to the next. Exactly. I think it's it's important, you know, to keep some consistency and. Uh, I, my hope is that in, you know, in a couple of years, in some years from now, uh, you look at the watch and you see this shape on the dial and you see, okay, so it's an isotope. It's, uh, you can add, automatically identify it and understand what's, what's, what you are looking at. Yeah, I mean, I think there are certain brands that have the ability to... This is the other, this is the blue version as well. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, there cool. are certain brands that are really, really very consistent in the design themes carrying over from one model to the next, and they, they become known for those themes, and, and people start to think of them as the inventor of that shape of handset or that, you know, flourish in the design, and if somebody else does it, it's like, all right, well, you know, he, he's copying this other guy, but even if they're not thinking about copying, people understand, like, okay, those are Rolex hands, or, you know, somebody will be able to look at your models in the future and go, okay, I, I know that instantly is an isotope because of the teardrop shape on the dial. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. I think that, you know, it's, it's important to create some, uh, uh, some sort of, um, of, of, of gimmick, some sort of aspect that really makes people understand uh, what they are looking at. And uh, I want them to be proud when they show that they are using an isotope and therefore you know we are really really investing in quality uh, to make these uh, uh, become very durable watches that's that's what uh, what what we are aiming for so at, as we are preparing for this call what i usually do is i'll open up uh, the other guy's website and i'll make sure i i am familiar with each model that they're working on and see if they have anything coming and I'll also look at, you know, your Facebook page, make sure I know where you're from. Um, I didn't realize you were working on this very nice looking field watch. This is, it just says old radium titanium. Is that exactly. the next project? Yeah, this is the next project. And, um, and in fact, I have a review coming up very, very soon. This is the one. Yeah, that's beautiful. So I guess I said it was a field watch. I guess it's more like a, a pilot watch, but either way, I mean, it's a very obviously military inspired watch. Yeah. I love yeah. the design. Tell us about it. So the design, I also have this here. This is the, the this is the automatic version. Right. Uh, in this, in this shape. And uh, the case is made out of titanium. This grade two, grade titanium. five. Uh, grade two. Grade two titanium, okay. Uh, so this is the first, um, the first try in titanium. And uh, the first case we did, it was horrible. Uh, the finishing was really bad, but then we changed supplier and this is outstanding. It's, it's you know, I, I, we, I, I, I'm working with, with a couple of very good photographers and it's very, even if this model is extremely complex to take good pictures of it. Why, why do you say it's complex? What is it that makes it such a challenge to photograph? I don't know. Uh, I think none of the pictures can really express how beauty it is. Is it a, a blasted finish? Uh, no, it's not blasted. Uh, the case, yes, the, the case is blasted. But the dial and um, uh, the construction of the dial, uh, I don't know. It, it's difficult. The, the, is it, the dial looks like, not the center section, the teardrop, but the rest of the dial looks like it's got like a sunburst. Or sunray, yeah, exactly, exactly. That is sometimes can be very difficult 
So I know where you're going. So when, when photographers take pictures, they use Photoshop to remove glare and reflections and any dust on the crystal. But when they do that, they're also removing color and texture and they're kind of like smoothing exactly. things out and you don't get the full feel for what's really going on there. Yeah, it, it loses, it loses uh, a lot of, of the quality inherent to it. Uh, I don't like, um, I don't like studio photography because of that. And, and your, your photos are very good. I can tell your photographer is very good, but I've, I've spent so much time and money on studio photography only to get the images where I'm like, they're not, they're not, okay. Yes, there's no dust. There's very little glare. The colors are kind of sort of right, but they've taken all of the, the realness out of the design. It's a professional photograph, but I don't think it really displays what the product is all about. I don't even think it's very flattering to the product, but we're not trying to deceive anybody. So we started using 3D renders as the official images, and we'll supplement those with real life photos that either I'll take myself or one of the guys on my team will take, or we'll use customer photos. We'll get customer's permission and say, you know, can we use your, we love your picture. Can we use it on our website? And we try to get everybody to look at our Instagram feed because our, our customers are taking better pictures than I've gotten from professional photographers. That's the point, exactly. <laughs> so it's called, is it, is it called Old Radium Titanium? Is that the name of the model? Yeah, this is the Old Radium, exactly. But, it, so, but the, loom, the pictures look like the loom is C3. It's not that, the, the loom is not the Old Radium color of loom, correct? It is. It is? The loom, it is the old radium. Uh, I can't tell. It looks, yeah. C, it looks like C3 to me. It doesn't look that dark like old radium. Yeah, but that's, that's why we can't really show. Oh, hold it up to the camera so we can see the loom up close. Yeah, I'm still not seeing it. Okay, so old radium yeah. is a little bit more, it's darker. It's a little bit more brownish in its tone or beige yeah. than C3, which is kind of more like a very, very pale yellow. Yeah, no, that, that's the point. This is, this is exactly what I want to say, because in real life, you can see it's, it's, the, it's the old radium Luminova, but in pictures, you can't. So are, are you going to do any with other loom colors, or are they all going to be old radium? Old radium. All yeah. the old radium. All right, yeah. so it's, it's got this beautiful sunburst dial, which I guess is either very dark gray or, or maybe dark gray. Dark gray. Yeah, dark gray. Okay. With the black. There, are there other dial colors that you're doing? Uh, not at the moment. So just one dial color, with or without a date. Exactly. So D the date is automatic. Blasted titanium case, yeah. old radium loom, 40 millimeter case. The, um, the metered minute track, it looks like either it's raised up or it's beveled. Is that right? It's raised up and beveled. Yes, exactly. Raised up so, and beveled? Yes. It's a, it's a very complex construction, uh, but I think, it, it, you know, it's, it's again, Vicente's uh, solution. Can, we, can you hold the case up so we can see it from the side? Hold, turn it to the side. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so is that like a raised uh, sapphire crystal? Uh, no, this is a, a very simple, this is a bezel, a fixed bezel here. Right. So, bezel, yeah. I've got the bezel. But it has a, 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 flat, a flat crystal. Yeah, but so, I think I can see a little bit of the crystal edge above the bezel. So the, the crystal is a little bit raised up from the bezel, right? You can kind of see a little bit of the edge. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So I'll I like that. I, I think that's a nice touch. Yeah, it's, it's uh, okay. So. so it's 40 millimeters. How thick is it? Uh, this is 1.3, I think. 1.3. 11.3? Uh, exactly. What eleven point three? Exactly. So, what's inside? It's either a quartz movement or an automatic. What's the automatic? Yeah, so this is the same case. So in, in this one, it's the Miota. Okay. Uh, and it's the nine zero one five, and uh, in the other one, it's a Swiss quartz. Ronda. Uh, Ronda. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Three year battery, five year battery, something like that. Uh, yeah, it's the Super two thousand thirty five. So it's about three years battery, I think. Okay. Yeah. So quartz or automatic, same case, titanium, grade two titanium, blasted finish, beautiful dial, old radium loom, with or without a date, comes 
obviously it looks like you're selling it on a NATO. Is there going to be a bracelet or another strap yeah, with it? We have, we have a, a leather um, uh, NATO as well. Okay. And I am also uh, making some tests with oh, a parachute strap. The parachute stripe, which is quite comfortable. Uh, but I really don't understand what's the fuss. <laughs> Comfortable, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna throw one of these in. I don't understand what everybody loves about it, but we're doing it anyway. I love that. Um, <laughs> so when is this going to be available? When are you launching this? Uh, early next year. Early next year. Yeah, I think I'm going to wait for early next year. I want to really look uh, very careful to the diver. Uh, uh, the the diver will be delivered in November. Uh, so after November, I, I, I want to focus on, on, on the other ones. Okay. Uh, uh, I might launch the Palonchino and the, the, uh, and the field watch at the same time. Let's see. Let's see. I, I, I think I'm going to try to avoid Kickstarter. So if I can do that, that will be great. The, the Kickstarter is tough. You know, obviously there's a lot of watch projects on there and, you know, one of the things I've, started to become kind of I, I i said this for a while that one of the challenges of the kickstarter is as a project creator you have no way of knowing who else is planning to launch a kickstarter project at the same time you are exactly, so yeah. you might get lucky and you know nobody else is really doing anything quite like what you're doing or there's maybe just not that many launch projects on there or you could get unlucky and there could be 50 or 60 and a few of those are really big and they're sucking up all the attention mm -hmm. And even if there aren't any really big projects and nobody's doing anything quite like you are, I mean, I just counted the other day, there were over 40 current projects on Kickstarter as of like two nights ago when I looked. So I thought, wow, that, that, how do any of those projects, if they don't have a huge marketing budget, how do they get the attention onto their project? So that, you know, that's a challenge for a lot of creators. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to hear that. You know, even even without uh, marketing campaigns that are, are watches that really work on Kickstarter, I think it's and okay. So there are a few brands that they have been collecting, you know, emails and contacts for a long time, but there are some that they really, you know, just pop in Kickstarter, and they sell really really well, uh, which is amazing. I, I I really you know don't understand if. Uh, they have the opportunity to 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 make some review on some specific um, blog or magazine that really pushes their product up uh, or whatever they are doing in the background because they really uh, okay so some designs are really good period some uh, you know innovations are quite interesting some designs really need. Uh, uh, really deserve to be produced, but there are lots of crap being sold there. Oh yeah, and, and they sell it as well, which is unbelievable. It, uh, it's so, all about the three P's: it's product design, pricing strategy, exactly. and promotion. I mean, that's it. If there's a if if the project fails, it was weak in at least one of those areas. If a project succeeds, it was maybe it was strong maybe in all those areas or really strong in one area. And you're right. I mean, there are projects we look at on Kickstarter and, and you know, guys that are in the business. We sort of understand production costs and we know, even if we don't know which factory is making a watch, we can, we can usually get a pretty good estimate of what a watch costs to make. And then you look at what they're selling it for and you think they're not making any money. What's the point? It, there's no, they're doing all this work on design, they're doing all this work on promotion, and then they have to do all the work to produce the watch, quality control, ship it out, answer all the customers' questions, and, and you know, respond to all their requests for support, and they're not making any money. Like, how, why do people do it? I don't get it. Yeah, uh, no, for example, and uh, well, I have, I'm having the same problem with, with the diver at the moment, because it's priced really low, but the idea is, exactly to uh, create um, a customer list. So I need to build um, uh, customers. I need, I need uh, to create, I need to offer something to the market that makes people 
um, you know, create their own um, communication for us. Uh, I need, because we have uh, sold a few riders, none of the buyers are using the watch. None of the buyers are on Facebook or on Instagram Showing they're, not, they're not helping you promote it by putting pictures of the watch up. You know. <laughs> mm. Well, I, and I, I wonder. The so, only you know, pictures I received were from a Canadian guy that uh, took a few pictures on his kitchen and sent me. I love it, and that's it. So all the others, they are, they not they are not promoting. But for that's example, interesting. I wonder, you know, is there something about? The, the, the customer for the rider, which is a $2,500 watch, yeah, it's being a, yeah, exactly. a customer at a higher price who's maybe less likely to spend his time on Instagram or Facebook or the forums talking mm -hmm. about this wonderful watch, whereas you know, my customer who's spending five, six, seven hundred dollars $700 is more likely to be on there. And so just by virtue of being at a different price, a lower price, you get a different customer who's more active online. And I definitely see that. I mean, I, I yeah, there, are, there are brands that I compete directly against and their, their pricing is lower than mine. And I see that they have sort of a bigger following. And I think, well, that makes sense. They're selling the product for less. That's going to be more attractive to more people. Exactly. And those, and they're going to, and oh, when exactly. somebody was like, you know, what's the best 200 meter, you know, water resistance diver for under 500 bucks? I know which brands they're going to say because it's under 500 bucks or whatever. Yeah, for example, if, if, if you buy a, a reach of mile for. You broke up. Uh, if you buy Richard, Richard Millet for how much? $65,000, for example. Yeah. You are going to show it because you buy the reach and you like to show it. Well, and that's, that's people are showing off. I can afford a Richard Millet. Exactly. Yeah. But if you buy a Patek Philippe for, for the same value or um, uh, a similar watch or similar brand for the same value, you will not show it the way you show, you, you show that one because it's a different mindset. Exactly. So you, you, you buy it to, um, you know, either as, as an investment or to use it for you, not it's advertising for our ego. It's the same guys that go on Instagram and they post a picture of the watch on the steering wheel of a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. It's like, exactly. okay, we get it. You're rich <laughs> enough already. <laughs> but anyway, you know, that's, that's, for example, uh, out of curiosity, some of the, the rider customers, they are clients uh, for um, Hawks and Jr. You know, the Swiss brand that is completely right. brandless. Yeah. Most of them say, oh, I, I, I saw your, uh, I saw, I liked it because, uh, you know, it's, it's very different from Oxen Junior, but uh, I think it has the same uh, anonymity concept, which is fine. Okay. Wonderful. That, that's great. I, I wish I was Oxen Junior. I'm not, unfortunately. <laughs> so this brings up sort of another one of my, you know, sort of theories is that at a certain, I guess at, at almost every price point, a lot of people like to feel as if their purchase decision has been pre-approved by the big name bloggers or the crowd of people on the internet. So, you know, if Hodinkee, let's say, reviews an Oaks and Junior or an Oak and Oscar, then okay, well, Hodinkee approves of it, so that means I can I can go now and spend two thousand dollars or three thousand or whatever the number is to buy this watch. Yeah. But if Hodinkee hasn't covered, say, the rider, then people look at that and they go, "That's twenty five hundred dollars. It's a lot of money. I don't know this brand. They haven't been covered in Hodinkee. Why aren't they being covered by Hodinkee? So maybe I should go and look at an Oaks and Junior or an Oak and Oscar or something else in that price range instead. Or they go, well, whatever Hodinkee says, for that kind of money, I can go and I can get a used Omega or a Tudor or whatever. And those are, those are crowd approved brands. Everybody online will know that I bought an Omega or a Tudor and that's a good decision. So as a brand like ours with, you know, very small fan base, no real major media attention and you know not a huge marketing budget and 
no ability to get celebrity endorsement or, you know, the beautiful people wearing our watch on the red carpet where that's the way it gets out there. We really rely on customer word of mouth, especially online, so that, you know, maybe the big blogs do get attention. But, you know, like um, yeah. Nick Harris from Orion, like he just got covered in Hodinkee recently. And then I noticed like very soon after the model that Hodinkee covered became sold out. I thought, well, that first off, that's great for Nick. Congratulations to him. But it just shows what the huge audience that Hodinkee has, you know, that power that Hodinkee has to make or break a brand. So if Hodinkee covered the rider, you'd probably sell 300 in a day, maybe. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's very true. You know, the, the, the problem is, I'll, you know, for us that are making uh, watches um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a price tier that is, uh, fair for the market um, it's very difficult for us to get um, an interview or to be shown by Odinki um, the watches I'm making now are not Odinki material maybe uh, but the rider is right the rider, and whoever sees the rider and if he, the, 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 we have a review the first review uh, that as is ever coming out will be shown by um, I'm not going to say but it, it's uh, so I, I I met the journalist at Wimbledon this year so last week he show I, I showed him the rider and he was you know whoa this is this is the watch so he made the review he's going to publish it and I'm sure that uh, that will create some impact in the industry I hope so good luck with that yeah, because, uh, let's hope so. I'm I'm really curious to see the review because I think it's going to be fantastic. And in this year and a half that the watch has been um, in the market, uh, I never made a review. I didn't want to. There's been no reviews of the rider other than people that bought it maybe saying something about it online, which hasn't really happened very much. Yeah, and most clients are friends of the other guy that bought it and they saw it on a party, for example. I showed, it, I showed it to some friends on the forum a year ago or so, and um, I don't remember if it was in the same discussion, but I do remember I've seen this. People will say about the rider, well, why is it $2,500? It's only a basic <laughs> at a 2824. And I'm like, Time out. <laughs> it's not a basic 2824. It's based on a 2824, but there's this whole other level of watchmaking that had to go into making it a jump hour. It's not a basic 2824 that you're going to find in a $600 watch. It's much more than that. It's a lot more complex than that. It's, it's a lot more complex. It's very, very complex. Even for all the other watches. Okay, so we can spend, you know, uh, a couple of Andrews making a watch and we are selling it for 200 and something, for example, uh, to start with. But, you know, we have a company, we have a structure behind it, you know, uh, all the taxes, uh, of import taxes, export taxes, uh, everything that goes behind it, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. So I didn't, so the company is open for, since 2016, 2015, but 2016, we start selling it. Um, there are no, no profit yet. So it's really complex to yeah. manage a company without profit, but that's our investment. That's why, you know, we are really uh, sleeping less hours every day to try to respond to everyone on time, to try to uh, satisfy all sorts of custom uh, desires. So, oh, can you do it this way? Can I have this way? Can I have a different case back? Can I have- It never ends. I mean, no matter what you do, something yeah. will have to be done differently. And and some some uh, customization, uh, I'm I'm happy to do. Like we can do it. Okay, on the rider, yes, on the rider we have. Oh, because the rider you're making them when people order them. Yeah, but but in a in a in a three hundred dollar watch, there is not really space to do that. No, so, uh, and even in a six hundred dollar watch, people ask me all the time, "Can I get it with this bezel or those hands, or get it without the bracelet?" I'm like, I make thirty different versions of this one watch. 
Yeah. Date, no date, different colors. I'm not customizing it. We've got 30 different choices. Pick one that we've already come up with. Don't ask me to change this or change that. It's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, but you know, at, at the time, I'm still trying to respond to, to some of those customizations because it's fine. You know, if, if it's easy, I'm happy to do it. And, right. Uh, it's going to be a little more, more uh, complex in terms of production, but that's fine. We can get there. Um, you know, I, I think that the first impression uh, that uh, we as a company, not as individuals, but as a company, uh, when we are talking to new customers and when they see that we really love what we are doing and that the company is uh, creating something that we love, but they really appreciate as well. I think that this connection will make them come back. That's that's what we are hoping for. Not not yeah, only I mean, everyone, right? People, yeah, I mean, uh, there there's there are these discussions online always from you know watch enthusiasts about I can get the same thing or same specs in a watch for less, and I think well, you're not buying a, a box of parts to make a watch. You're paying for the assembly, the quality, but you're also paying for the owner's time, the designer's time, you're paying for the brand story. If all you want is steel case, sapphire crystal, Swiss movement, bracelet, sure. clasp, you can actually buy all of those parts on eBay and put the watch together yourself. Exactly. But exactly. somebody has to design the dial if you want it to be different. Somebody has to put it all together if you don't want to put it together yourself. And these are not rational decisions that we're making. If you just want something to tell time, go buy a $10 Timex. You have to really love the design, the story. And part of that is the, the owner engaging online and, and, and talking to people, you know, publicly or privately with emails and, and private messages. So if somebody's going to buy an isotope, you want them to love the watch but I believe that they're probably at least partially buying the watch because they love you and they love your story and talking to you and they feel like a, a kinship with you. And that's really part of buying from a small brand like ours. You don't get to talk to the CEO of Seiko, but you can talk to the CEO of a micro brand. Exactly. That's true. Uh, and, uh, and for example, for, for the diver one, which I think is quite interesting, I always, uh, this is the one. So the, the blue version, this is the called Nordblad version. Uh, because uh, a couple of years ago, I saw online a video uh, about Johanna Nordblad, uh, a video made by a guy called Ian Derry. And uh, the video that is on our website, you can, you can take a look afterwards, shows Johanna um, as a champion of uh, ice diving. Um, uh, so she dives under the ice. In Finland, uh, so I contact her. She's, so she's crazy. She, you're, you're saying she's insane, basically. <laughs> so she much under the ice time. where people die. Yeah, that's where she goes. Okay, good. Okay, so she's got woman called her uh, a kick-ass woman online, which I think it's it's a really good description. These are uh, pictures on the on the website on the product page, right? With the, the exactly. little woman with the sweater. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. her. <laughs> I was expecting kind of a very sturdy woman. She looks very dainty. No, nah, but she must be sturdy. But you uh, know, but it's it's at least she's she's very brave, and uh, so we we created this version as an homage to her. As a, um, uh, I think this was the first time that because I I I I was never very. Um, turned on by you know influencers or uh people that really want something to show the watch no i had to chase her i had to explain her that we wanted we had a, a diving watch with characteristics that could be used under the ice uh the case is thicker than a normal case exactly to resist to the environment you can use this under the ice without problems which is true um, and so she became interested in the story of the watch 
I was very interested in, in her story as well. And she said, okay, so let's, let's do something together. Let's try to make this a reality. And therefore, we are using the ice blue color uh, to represent the ice, okay? And this has been, uh, so we have the blue version and the orange version, which is this one, but the blue version is selling better. Uh, I think it's because it's more unique, it's more different than the, than, than the rest. But, you know, going, working with someone like Johanna Nordblad uh, and creating these, this has been quite an experience because people connect in a different way. And I have been talking to people that never, were never interested in getting a watch, uh, but this is signed by Johanna. So they want the watch because it's signed by her. So, you know, this is interesting for the community. And if you are planning to do a watch, for example, and you are listening to this, try to get an agreement with the champion. Try to get, you know, someone uh, online that is, uh, that has no, um, how do you say it in English, a glass, uh, 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 a glass roof. You know, glass ceiling. Yeah, you know, someone that you can uh, give her a watch and say, show it as if it was yours. And uh, without having any sort of problem that you come back or knock on your door. And that's exactly what is happening. So lots of new people that are coming to the brand are from Finland, but not only, uh, because they like what Johanna does. And that's quite interesting in terms of, of, of story. Um, but, you know, it's pointless for me to explain her life, but if you see the video, you'll understand exactly what, why she's diving under the ice. Um, basically, she broke she 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 broke a leg. Uh, it was very very painful. The only way to save her leg was to put her eyes her, her leg inside the eyes. Uh, so she started doing it, and that became a sport, and she became a champion, which is a fantastic fantastic. Uh, it does sound like an interesting story. Yeah, watch the video. It's 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 really short. It's really well shot. I'll check it out. Did you did you produce the video? Unfortunately, no. I ho I wish I had. <laughs> All right. We will we will make something very interesting because her sister is a photographer as well, and most of those amazing pictures you see were taken by her sister by Alina, and they make an amazing team. So in the in the winter, we are going to do something uh, very unique, hopefully. All right. So people can order the rider. And they have to understand that you don't have a bunch of riders sitting on the shelf already made. You yeah. wait for people to order them and then you make them. They yeah. can pre-order the go to o which you'll be delivering in November. And then yeah. next year, you're going to bring out the old radium titanium and probably the, you know, sort of Palancino. of the Palancino. Exactly. Um, what do you want to talk about? Anything else you're working on for the future? Is there a, another project that you want to post? Yeah, so for for the future, we are already planning a new uh, professional diver. Uh, so something more sturdy, something more complex than this Fire one. Fire specs, whatever. Exactly. Uh, and also a chronograph. Uh, that's the next step. That'll be cool. Yeah, that's, that's the next step. But um, it's, it's quite difficult to create a chronograph, as you know, <laughs> because, uh, you know, they are most designs have been uh, visited and revisited and it's really complex to create something different and original as we like to 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 make uh, but at the same time uh, needs to be familiar so you you can see yourself for, on, uh, on the design and that's 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 uh, that's our I, will, I wouldn't say secret but uh, if you create something that really that you can look at and understand where have I seen this, but you can really define where you met that or where you saw that, you become you, you will love the design. You don't really know why, right? Uh, but and that's exactly the experience we try to uh, 
to give uh, to our to our customers. For example, one detail that I didn't explain yet. This balloon shape here, I, I'm getting this one because it's it's easier to show. Uh, this balloon shape, this is the shape of a um, kitchen clock designed by Max Bill. Ah, okay. okay. So that's, a, that's a, based on a Max Bill who's from the Bauhaus school. Max Bill is a exactly. kitchen so, clock from the postmodern or modernist era. era. Anyone that knows, uh, that understands design, anyone that had, uh, uh, was lucky to have a grandmother with this uh, clock on the kitchen, We'll we'll look at this and we'll see. Okay, so yeah, I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it right now online. I see. What, so it's a clock, and then the bottom part is a timer. Exactly. <laughs> so I, mean, I was lucky enough to grow, uh, you know, walking to a clock like that. I had no clue it was. Wait, so you, somebody, your mom or your grandmother had this clock. Yes, we had. Uh, we had. No, no, no. I bought it when I was little. Oh, you bought what? a clock like when this when you were little. Yeah, I bought I bought that because I love the concept of having a timer in the bottom. I had no clue it was um, uh, it was it was Max Bill back then. I had no clue. You and didn't know who Max Bill was back then. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. I just knew I liked it you know, because you know ever uh, since, since I I know uh, I was uh, a teenager and even younger. Uh, design was always one of the things that really inspired me. See, now, I, now I'm looking at it and I see from all of your designs, I'm like, ah, okay. I, never, I had never seen this before. This is my first time looking at it. But now I'm looking at the vintage Youngins Max Bill kitchen exactly. clock. Exactly. And I see the little, the circle, the circular date window and the little, I don't know what that is. I guess it's a, a keyhole to uh, adjust the watch, the, the yeah, clock. Because it was not quartz, it was mechanical. No, it was a mechanical. So somebody had to be able to wind exactly. the clock. So there's a keyhole in the dial. Yeah, that is cool. So that one was ceramic, probably. Then there were a new, more recent ones made in backlit, uh, which was the first concept of plastic. Bakelite. Bakelite, yeah. Bakelite, yeah, right. Bakelite. That was the first plastic that we had in the market. So the first ones were ceramic and the next ones were Bakelite. Exactly. And the Bakelite ones, they already had a quartz movement. Right. Uh, which was easier uh, because uh, it's more I could spend. I could spend an hour looking at this. This is really cool. Yeah, this is really cool. And once you start understanding where the design concepts come from, uh, you will see, okay, so it's, it's not easy to get the inspiration, the initial inspiration, but once you get a design line and you, you, you stick to it, ideas will come up. And um, Vicente is very, very good doing this. He has won a few awards already. He also designed jewelry. And I know that as soon as I give him a concept, and say, okay, I want to do something like this. These are the examples. He can, he can really transform his idea and show amazing, amazing sketches and amazing concepts. And then we tune them uh, to, to, to the result you see uh, on the website. Uh, but that's, that's um, and, and this process is very long. All, all of the process uh, we take from, you know, scratch from from the concept until delivery, it takes one hour, one year, two years to get right. right. It's well, and, well, you know what I would like people to kind of understand from this conversation is, you know, a lot of us micro brand owners we don't hire designers. We are the designer. Um, some of us get design help. Like I think of myself as the designer, but I can't illustrate very well. So I have to get other guys that know how to illustrate who are also good designers themselves who understand our shared language of watch design to help me. But then there are other guys like you, they're actually hiring professional designers who are not cheap talent. They, you know, this guy that you're working with, 
you're spending a lot of money to have a professional designer design your watches. Again, like you're, you're doing things that much more mature companies do, no problem, because it's easy to hire a designer when you're making 5,000 watches and you can spread the cost out. But if you're making 500 watches, it's like 10 times the cost per watch for the designer. Yeah, well, I have an excellent agreement with Vicente, so I can't complain, obviously. But still, yeah. I mean, you're not doing it yourself. You're hiring somebody. Exactly, exactly. So we, I create the concept with him, but then um, he finished the product. And we trim every single detail uh, by going back and forth with all the ideas until we get the results. And, uh, right. But we are you know, in the same wave. Uh, the, the, it's 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 um, uh, it's uh, I, I know I love him. It's it's fantastic. That's but, a good relationship. Yeah. So yeah. it's like that with me and my guys on my design team. We have, again, you know, we, we some very almost identical tastes in what we like, and you know, we've all spent time on the forums, so we all kind of understand what that market really wants and. You know, we all are watch geeks ourselves, so we understand sort of watch design language. So when I tell them, like, okay, I want a waffle dial or a sandwich dial, or I want something like, you know, whatever, they understand immediately what I mean. I don't have to, I don't have to really show them. Um, yeah. Sometimes we get a little bit confused about, well, I, I meant, I really meant this, not that, but, you know, it, it doesn't happen too often. And sometimes it's, it's a good accident, you know, that we were, we're working on a design now that was, inspired somewhat by the uh, vintage Universal Genev pole router. And I had one version of the pole router in mind, but when I mentioned it to Aaron, he went to a completely different version, which is also cool, but not really what I was thinking about when I said it. So we kind of ended up with something that was a bit different than what I originally was thinking about. Um, all right, so this has been great. So Isotope Watches is the website. The Goat to O is available for pre-order right now. You're delivering it in November. You can yeah. still get a rider made to order, very customizable, fantastic, unbelievable watch, especially even for the money. Um, and you've got these other two designs coming back out or coming out first time for the old radium titanium, yeah, the, very you know, sort of redo on the Palancino next year. This is great. So what do you want to, what do you want people to, to do next? Just go to your website, buy a watch. I guess it's kind of straightforward. That will be great, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that will be great. No, at the moment, as I said, you know, I'm really focused on the diver. Uh, I think that it deserves my full attention at the moment. Uh, we are finishing um, uh, some details that are uh, like the packaging, for example, for example, which is something we didn't spoke about, but it's it's really complex to packaging for the diver. Yeah, exactly. I, I wanted something very specific, but you know, it's it's so difficult to find uh, the right packaging for the right price. Oh yeah, uh, it's it's a struggle. It's really a struggle. But it really is. We'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, but yeah, so more the the packaging companies don't want to do like samples because it's like what are they going to do? They're going to charge you a thousand dollars for a sample box. Like there, there's no there's no economy in doing that so they, they they send you something that is kind of sort of what you want maybe not they don't know um also you, you've got a big instagram following you've got eleven thousand followers at isotope.watches that's interesting that's very interesting uh, the community is very it's it's huge but you know i have eleven thousand followers but for each picture we have we have you know not uh too many likes I don't know if it's because people... Um, I think you're doing good. There's one right on here, 400 likes. I mean, that's more than my pictures usually get. And I've got, you know, 20... Yeah, but, you know, followers. that's not the same how the algorithm is working these days uh, for Facebook and for Instagram. But anyway, I, I think the message is, is passing by. For, for example, this morning... Uh, this morning, we know last, last yesterday... I, I posted the picture of the diver and five minutes later, we had uh, a new pre-order. So it's working. Uh, I don't know how, how well it's working, but it's working. Uh, but you know, the, the, 
most of our customers are not coming from Facebook or from Instagram. They come from the reviews that are out, out there and from all the PR um, activities we are having. So, um, yeah, sometimes I think if the time we spend on Facebook and Instagram and other social networking, it's really worth the investment. It, it's uh, harder. So if you, my observation, just, you know, for whatever it's worth is, if you are making something that, this is maybe stupid obvious, I started talking about this before I realized it. I think it is stupid obvious. If you're making something that the people on Facebook and Instagram like, everybody says you have to be on Facebook and Instagram. But what they don't say is you only should be on Facebook and Instagram if you're making something that the people there like, because otherwise you're just wasting your time. If you're making something that is more oriented for a higher level customer who isn't there or the mass market, you have to do something else. You have to find you know, coverage in, in a blog or you have to do advertising yeah. and it could be a longer sales cycle like you know, you said that you posted a picture on Instagram and you got a, an order right away. I mean, you, you can start to measure the life cycle of a sale or the, you know, the, the, the funnel. How long does it take, you know, from doing something here to getting a sale here? Very often it can be instant with some designs and some venues and others. It's like you have to advertise for three months before anything happens. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. Yeah, but that's that, that's the hardest part I know at the business at the moment, because without having a big budget to to advertise and to show it, it's complex. It's complicated. It's difficult. What's it like? And then you end up, you know, going, okay, well, I'm going to start tailoring my my designs for these people who I know I can reach because they're in the Facebook groups or they're on the forums or all, they're on Instagram, and then. You, go, you do that, you put the picture of what you think they want up there, and then of course people start complaining, like, well, it's just the same as everybody else. And I'm like, because everybody else likes, because every, everybody else is making, all the other guys like me are making stuff for you because we're basing this on what you say you like, and then you complain that it's the same as everybody else that's making it for you. We keep giving you, it's like everybody's making pizza. Well, everybody loves pizza, and you keep saying you love pizza, you like a good pizza, we give you a pizza and you go, everybody's making pizza. Why are you making pizza? <laughs> that is very true. Yeah. There, anyway. Anyway, yeah, this is, you know, it's a lifestyle. I think that we have, we have, um, uh, we, we really need, we really need to love what we are doing here. And I oh, think yeah. that uh, we can see that uh, with, how worried we get sometimes when the design is not the way we really want it to be, or something is not going the way we want it to be. And um, uh, I think that when our audience and customers understands that, they say, okay, so let's see what this guy is doing. And uh, if, if they are on the same you know, wavelength as we are, it's fantastic. And when that happens, it's really, it's really, yeah. Boarding. It's really that's, that's when the magic happens.